that actually answered all those questions for the instant Takametsu piece that I did, like, what, two years ago now? Yeah, but I kind of tried to answer them differently this time. Yeah, and you did. So I'm, I'm going to post it again because I think uh, there's a lot of good new stuff. And I'll just link to the original article. So okay. this time we can just concentrate, for the most part, on the, um, on the Zen Choir. And I did have some questions about that. You know, the, you, you have a, um, a basic definition of conduction on your site. But uh -huh. I'm, I'm more curious about the nuts and bolts of how it actually, how did it, like in the case, let's say in the case of the, the Zen Choir, how did it actually work? What, are the, what kind of signals do you use and what do they represent? Okay, so in, in Butch's conduction lexicon, which is what I just finished articulating for the book, uh, there's probably, I don't know, a total of 40-some signs. Okay, so like for example, that, let me get my camera so, okay, so like that means to repeat something, okay, what the musician chooses to repeat is up to them, okay, so, so basically in conduction, the, the conductor is responsible for structure and the musicians are responsible for content. So would repeat something mean repeat what you just played or repeat it anything could, in, you played? In the case of repeat, a repeat can have uh, three instances. So if you're not playing, so basically it happens like this. You give the sign, and the sign can be given to the entire ensemble or to one person or to a group within the ensemble. And the sign tells you what we're going to do, but you don't do anything until the downbeat comes. And then that tells you when we're doing that thing. So if you weren't playing and, I, and you saw this sign, when the downbeat came, you would repeat something. And that could be as simple as just bop, 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 bop. Or it could be a long melodic phrase. It could be whatever you wanted to repeat, but it has to be something that you repeat. So it doesn't mean to just start playing. It means to create something that you can repeat. If, you were, if we were in the middle of something, and all of a sudden you were doing something just so killer, my hand just went like that, it would mean repeat what that last phrase was you played. Okay? Right. Or if, if someone else, let's say there was the guitar player on the end of the line was playing something, and I went to you and said, repeat that, I would want you to duplicate what he was, what he was playing. And there's about, there's about 40 signs uh, that uh, rep they're basically like um, visual representations of the building blocks of music that have to do with pitch and duration and... Uh, Different, they're very, very s simple on a certain level. The thing I really have enjoyed about conduction, and I've been doing it for 28 years, well, 30 years now. I've been conducting for 15, and I've been doing it as a musician for 30. The thing I really like about it is, on the surface of it, it appears really simple. But the more you do it, it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper what the possibilities are. And you arrive at things that you really couldn't arrive at with written music, and you arrive at things that you really couldn't arrive at with just free improvisation. So it's a way to s structure musical content with a large ensemble in real time. And it really kind of like bridges this place of interpreting written material and improvisation. But it basically comes down to the, the conductor is providing structure and is responsible for providing structure, and the musician is uh, responsible for providing the content. Right. Well, that, that makes sense. I mean, and it, it obviously requires a certain degree of musicianship. I mean, I know I would have trouble repeating something I just played. <laughs> I, 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 tend, 
I tend, you know, once it's gone, it's gone a lot of times, <laughs> or, you know, and then and then being able to repeat something someone else plays requires the ears and the technique to be able to do that, you know, so. It's it's true, and, and in that case, in the repeating, well, it's interesting, both things you said, because I've done this with really young student musicians, and you'd be surprised how it's mostly the the what people perceive in this as something they think is going to be problematic once they actually do it they discover that it 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 isn't problematic and they're actually much better equip, equipped than they think they are and and in terms of of repeating something that someone else played it's it's more about repeating the rhythmic aspect and the intent of of the idea rather than repeating a note per note copy of of that right that, well, that makes sense and um, and that, that answered my next question which is who determines what notes are played so that that would be the musicians themselves the musicians themselves because there was and one o um, one OOC video I was looking at with string players and a vocalist and it the it sounded almost composed. I mean, it sounded well, yeah. Well, that's the thing that is really amazing. It's like it's like you don't discuss key. You you can, but my experience is is you don't discuss key. You don't discuss scales. You don't discuss um, what time we're going to be in, and yet I can give you a time like like this means to to wait. I'm going to show you something, and if you're not playing, it means I'm going to show you something. Don't respond until I give the downbeat. If you are playing, it means continue what you're doing, but I'm going to show you something new. So if I went like this. Okay, that would mean I want you to do whatever we're going to do in this tempo. Okay, and it doesn't mean that I want you to show me that tempo. It means I want you to play in that tempo. Okay, and to your comment about what you heard with the, uh, I think you probably saw the uh, encore we did at the uh, one of the High Mayhem festivals, and it and it sounds very composed, and. That's the thing that's interesting is is because of this of the signs you, it doesn't come out being like it would be if everybody was doing free improvisation. Now sometimes free improvisation can sound very structured. Other times it can sound very unstructured. That really depends on the sophistication of the free players, really, and how and how much they're trying to create an ensemble music, or how much they're just playing free, you know, in that kind of, I mean, free music really came out a lot of it was a lot about individual virtuosity than it than it was, and sometimes it does sound like five people taking solos in the same room at the same time, you know, but when you work with improvisers who have been doing it for a long time and really come from the point of view of uh, creating an ensemble music a lot of free improvisation can sound very composed the thing that's interesting about conduction is because it's using these kind of visual analogs of the building blocks of music and the conductor is the one responsible for creating structure uh, Things can sound very composed. Like there's one sign, like if if we've got maybe ten people in the ensemble and I've got a section over here doing a series of sustains, this means to this camera thing is funny. This means to make a continuous sound, or what would be the equivalent in music of a fermata, you know? Right, a held tone. A held tone, exactly. So if I am doing a series of those and these strings are going, playing these ba dee da da and then I tell them to repeat that. They're repeating this series of chords, and then I could have someone over on the other side playing in a tempo, okay, 
playing, repeating something within a tempo, and then I could have someone else come in and play over the top of that, then I could make that entire thing memory one. So five minutes later, ten minutes later, we could be in a completely different place, and I go memory one now, and the whole ensemble goes back to what they were doing at that place. And so you can bring themes back, and so it can sound very, very composed. The thing that's, that's really fascinating is if I show you this sign, you have to come up with what you're going to play. Okay? I have no idea what you're going to play. Right. So, when, so when I hold up a sign and give a downbeat, what comes back to me is a complete surprise. Okay, and I have no control over that content. What I'm responsible for at that point in time is then shaping that. And and it really is. It's it's interesting. It's it's like the musicians have to be completely in the moment and not thinking, and just immediately respond whatever that means to you whatever you want to repeat at that point in time and of course this is based on listening to everybody else and trying to make an ensemble music based on what you hear around you but whatever that means for you at that point in time that's what you play and it is it is what i hear it's the it's the uh, it's the sonic manifestation of that sign that then tells me what the next sign is. So even though the conductor appears to be in control, what actually happens is a feedback loop starts and the music, the musical form actually creates itself if everybody just stays out of the way. And you get to these places where you go back and you listen to it and it's like, wow, how did we ever how did we ever arrive at that? But it's it, it, it's just fascinating how you basically what I've learned from doing this for like 15 years as a conductor is, is as long as you stay out of the way and are just completely in the moment and don't come in with any kind of agenda, the music will unveil its, un unravel itself and reveal itself in a way that you, you would have never come up with those choices if you would have sat down and, and tried to make a piece. So it's, Right, but in some way, well, so because in some ways the orchestra is you, you are one of the instrumentalists, but the instrument is your art is the orchestra. Exactly. So That's, you're you're responding to what they're doing and and creating stuff and then seeing where it goes and and I, do you feel that in some ways you are sort of the overall arbiter of tension and release in the music in that respect that you can sort of bring the music into more, you know dynamic and dissonant places and sort of smooth it out or to totally in a uh, totally through structure but you still have no control over content right but but obviously if, if you've accrued and the most that I've been able to do in a single piece is maybe seven or eight memories now now think of that as a player where you've got eight different things that you have to be responsible not only for what you were playing but also how it related to what everybody else was playing and you I might be up there going memory one go memory two go now crossfade to memory three go and as a musician you have to be responsible so it, it there's a huge level of responsibility to the ensemble in this kind of playing more so than I've ever seen in either a uh, an ensemble that interprets written music or an ensemble that does free improvisation we we did one in uh, with Butch we did one in uh, Italy in, in Tuscany and we worked with a symphony orchestra okay and he had I was doing live sampling okay and it was an acoustic concert and off stage, they had a 32 input mixer and they mic'd everything in the ensemble, okay? And they were using that for recording. And it was not being used for sound reinforcement. And then they sent me eight submixes from that mix up to my mixer on stage, and I was live sampling sections of the ensemble. And, um, 
it was it, it's like this kind of natural orchestration tool within conduction. So Butch was working with the uh, the strings on the left, and he was have this is the sign for harmonics. So however you make harmonics on your instrument, that's what you would do. So he had the strings doing these harmonics, and then he gave me the sign for to sample, which is that, means to grab that. And so I sampled this, and then he cut them off and brought me in, and so this whole like cloud of harmonics just moved back to where I was, and I had two speakers up where I was. And so this whole cloud of harmonics just moved to the back of the orchestra, but it was still there. And then he worked with the same strings and had them doing something on top of that. And when we we rehearsed with that orchestra for three days, and this was like a total black page orchestra that was used to uh, doing the really intense contemporary classical music. And none of them consider themselves to be soloists at all. And by the end of the third day before we went on to do the, the concerts, what the flute player who spoke really good English said that they had been talking among themselves and they said that this was the it required more focus than they had ever experienced with the most intense written material but at the same time they had this unbelievable feeling of liberation because they were responsible for what they were playing and when we played the first concert in um, uh, Florence it was in one of these big opera houses right and you know with the box seats all the way around dome and after the concert we played a, 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 a an evening concert no written material at all completely using conduction after the concert we were sitting in the dressing room and the door like burst open and this music critic burst into the room and he demanded to see the music <laughs> And he, he couldn't wrap his head around the fact that this orchestra had created a piece from nothing. And he was looking in everybody's briefcases. He was convinced <laughs> That's that, so there, European. <laughs> that there was a score and that Butch had make, made this entire orchestra memorize this music. And he just he couldn't believe that, they, that we had done this piece from nothing. Well, I can imagine when it, when it, when it works... As, yeah, you know, well as it can work, that's what it would end up sounding like. I was curious, what does OOC mean? I know it means out of context, but where does that? Well, basically, come the, from? the the ensemble that I had in in uh, New Mexico that that lasted for fifteen years, uh, I just called it out of context. Uh, it was just a name that made that seemed like an interesting name to me. So it was just the name of the ensemble. R right. Um, when you we talk about rehearsing what for something like this is the rehearsal obviously everything's going to be different in terms of the note the, the notes people play on the day of the um show but is the rehearsal getting people used to the signals and and you know learning what they are and learning to respond to them i mean is that what takes place in rehearsal yeah and and i mean to begin with it, it's like we would never use the word rehearsal because in, in, as you know, in the musical world, especially the pretty professional musical world, a lot of times people will throw things away in rehearsals. They won't focus, they won't, it, it, isn't, it isn't like the real deal. And the, the difference with this situation, which is why I don't use the word rehearsal, I just refer to them as sessions, is every time you do this, that's what you're doing, you're creating a piece. And you really have to instill in the musicians the, the responsibility to the music that comes along with this. And so uh, at the sessions, you're basically looking at possibilities. And the more you understand the signs and are comfortable, you know, there, there's this learning curve where first you have to remember, oh, that means I'm supposed to repeat something. This means I'm supposed to make a continuous sound. When you, when, when you get 
comfortable with your playing, you don't think about, oh, I have to put my finger on the third string to get that B. You don't think about that anymore. You just know that that's what you do. It's the same thing. Once you get comfortable with the lexicon, you just then respond. And so the sessions are really about creating pieces and and just getting more fluid with this. So then uh, when you go to do the performance, it's like, it's just the same thing as a session, only now there's people in the room. Yeah, of course. I mean, but, but like learning any other instrument, I mean, I assume the ensemble that you had for 15 years was way more fluid than an orchestra that you come in and have three days with or the... Absolutely, absolutely. There, there, there's no question. And Butch and I used to talk about this because Butch, Butch had done this for, um, well, he did it for 30 years before he passed. And he never had a single ensemble for more than 10 days. Oh, wow. And there's no question. And we, we used to talk about this because when I, when I started my ensemble, it was just going to be a one-off project. I just wanted to, I had been doing conduction as a musician with Butch for 12 years. And I thought, you know, I would better understand these signs myself if I tried conducting, you know. And so I put together two ensembles. One was in uh, Albuquerque and one was in San Francisco. And I did, and I wanted to try working with an actor because I wanted to work with text within an ensemble. So I did these two little pieces and I worked with each ensemble for, I would say maybe, I don't know, three sessions, four sessions, and then we did the concert. And then I went to San Francisco and I did the same thing with a different ensemble there. And then I came back to New Mexico and I said, you know, okay, that was a really an interesting experience. I'm going to think about that. But the musicians in the Albuquerque Ensemble, they wanted to continue. They really had so much fun doing it. So we decided to just get together once a month because everything's so far apart in New Mexico. And part of the band was from Albuquerque, part of the band was from Santa Fe, and I lived even further out. So we got together once a month and so for 15 years I, I work with this ensemble once a month, and some of the people in the band, well, I think when the band ended, there was two people in the band who had been in the band for 14 years. There was a number of people who had been in the band for 10 years, and that band got so amazing, and Butch and I w used to talk about this, about the difference between the situation he was in where he was always starting over and the situation where this had had would have a chance to work with the same musicians over time and the thing that was so sad about his passing when it when it happened was uh, about oh I guess about three months before he passed away he had just worked out a deal with a uh, an orchestra in Italy and he was going to move to Italy and he was going to have uh, the same orchestra. He was going to have them for a year. Oh, my. That's... And could you imagine yeah, that's what, what would have come from that after working with this way of working with music for a year with the same ensemble? With ensemble, an ensemble of that size would have been just uh, unbelievable. Right. Well, what made you decide to go with guitars this time? Oh, this is an interesting story. I had been doing uh, workshops, okay? And do you know the Punked Festival oh, in Norway? Sure. I, yeah, yeah. I would well, love to go. Uh, when I, the second, I was, uh, John Hassel had called me to do, well, you came to that show when, when we did the show in... Uh, um, in New York. New York. Yeah. Well, Jan Bong was on that, was in the band, and... He invited me to come to the punk festival to do some remixes. And then when he found out that I was doing this conduction thing, he said that, you know, they had this education outreach program as part of the festival. And 
he hooked me up with the college there, and I worked with their music students and doing conduction, and then they got to perform at the festival. And so it was a way that it would, you know, bring the community into the festival. Well, he brought me back the second year, and the first year it was an elective for the, for the students at the university. Anybody who wanted to do it could do it, okay? The second year, they made it a, a mandatory thing for their entire freshman class, okay? So I had this ensemble that was completely insane. There was, there, there was 38 of them. It was the whole freshman class. There was 11 opera singers. There was four drummers. There was four electric bass players. There was a brass quartet. There was a string quartet. There was two acoustic piano players, two organ players, and seven electric guitar players. And I just thought, like, you couldn't make this up. Who would ever put together an ensemble like this? It's crazy. Norway. That's a... Norway, yeah, yeah. Norway would do it. And so what I thought was, okay, so I've got this choir. I've got this vocal choir. So I put them on a riser straight across the back of the ensemble. And I took the drums and I made four drum and bass duos. And I, I put them in each corner. So rather than having them all together, I separated them because it would make them listen across the room instead of being right next to each other. And then I took the seven electric guitar players and I put them right in front of the vocal choir. And I told them all that I wanted them to, to you know, bring as many effects as they wanted. I wanted them to do feedback. I really wanted, since we had so many monophonic instruments and so many chordal instruments, that I wanted them to really concentrate on the more uh, kind of sculptural vocabulary that you can get out of the guitars. And they totally got into it. And some of the sounds that came out of this guitar choir was were just unbelievable. And it just gave me this idea that like, wow, this conduction vocabulary, if it was, if it was put on a, an, an ensemble just of the same instrument, it could be really interesting. And so I decided to do it with the, with the, with the guitars. And fortunately in Santa Fe, in Albuquerque, there's a lot of really interesting, unique guitar players. And the guitar players I chose would n not necessarily work together. You know what I mean? I mean, that's another thing that's interesting about conduction is you come up with these ensembles, and I think it's one of the keys of a good conduction is the makeup of the ensemble. And not only from an, inst an instrument point of view, but from what you know about the players. You know what I mean? Like how sensitive the players really are and how unattached to their egos they are and how much they really listen and how much they think ensemble as opposed to solo-wise. You know, I mean, so, there's... So many players who are great soloists, but they're not necessarily great ensemble players, you know? And so I, I started out with uh, eight players, and for whatever reason, two of them had, weren't able to commit to it. And so we ended up with six players and very, very radically different players. And, and, if, and I think I sent you the tech list. And yeah, you can see just from their gear how, how differently they approach it. Yeah, very, very different, you know. And it was the first time that I was confronted with dealing with the added thing of uh, pedal boards in this kind of way. I mean, in my ensemble, out of context, uh, I had Matt Deason, who was an amazing electric bass player, uh, who was running a, a rig of 10 pedals. And he was such a master of texture and being able to switch pedals off and on really quickly. Because if I've got a memory and he's got one chain of effects going and then I've got a different memory and he's got a different chain of effects, if I switch from memory one to memory two, he's got to be able to flip his whole rig 
as quickly as he flips his part. So here I was faced with having six people who were dealing with very large pedal boards. And originally I wanted everybody to have stereo rigs, but I thought it was going to be a nightmare. So we ended up going with mono rigs, and I actually, we, we actually had some discussions about rigs, and we actually had everybody sit with their guitars, amps, right on their right, very close, and actually angled in. So, you know, like one of the signs is harmonics, but we added this thing to where if I opened the sign up, it would mean turn that into feedback. So by having everybody, everybody had low wattage amps, and by having them right there on the floor, when I would open something into feedback, everybody would just could just lean into their amplifier. So there was a lot of, of things about the actual physical setup and and how kind of tailoring things to specifically for this this collection of instruments. Yeah, I was going to ask you, did you have to come up with some new signs for for this to reflect I whether you wanted delay or distortion? No, I didn't go into stuff. that. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't want to. I didn't want to um, be that specific with the uh, effects. I wanted everybody to have free reign on their on their effect choices because I thought that that rather than saying okay everybody use delays. I wanted to really everybody, because so much about conduction is, even though it's an ensemble music, it's, it's really about individual points of view. It isn't, you know, like with, a, with an orchestra, you may have 10 violins, but basically they're all doing the same thing. In conduction, it's about having an ensemble music that's made up of very, very strong individuals and very, very strong individual points of view. So I wanted everybody to have free reign of their delays. The only thing I requested was that they either, either they had a volume pedal or a kill switch at the end of the chain. So if I cut them off, they could just mute their sound without losing their chain. Right, and the delays wouldn't continue. You and the delays it, wouldn't continue. Breaks. So that was the only thing I, I imposed on it, was that they have some sort of kill mechanism at the very end of the chain. But other than that, all they had to worry about was the signs in, in terms of what they wanted to do. But it was interesting, as the more and more they got comfortable and the more and more they listened to each other, they started playing with delays and started playing with, oh, you know, this person's got this distortion going on, I'm going to use this distortion, you know. So it was interesting how, as it progressed, a, voc a vocabulary and an inter, um, kind of a uh, activity would happen, not only with the playing, but within the uh, pedal boards as well. So if you gave the signal for a formata for a held note. I mean, guitars have a, it's not like a, a violin where you can keep bowing or a horn where you can, you know, do sort of circular breathing if you can. Uh, how would they how would they keep the note going? Was were, were they doing This was interesting. Tremolo it's interesting. or feedback? Well, it's or? interesting cuz it, it and it's interesting that you brought up that sign of of sustain because that it was surprising to me with each group of instruments, some of the signs are like very like second nature to the instrument. And it's very easy for a musician to respond. Some of the signs may be more difficult on, a, on an instrument to uh, execute. What I found fascinating about, about the sustain sign with the electric guitars is when I first started doing that, they were all playing these really thick chords, and it sounded like shit. Okay, mm -hmm. and and I was I would and and yet if you're working with a set of brass players or wind players or vocalists 
or string players and you do sustains because they're playing all playing monophonically you get these very beautiful rich chords and yet with the guitars it was it was like a nightmare at first so what I said uh, was okay until we really understand this sign I want everybody to only play monophonically when you see this okay you can play octaves but that's it okay? okay that made a huge difference as for the sustain issue it would be like mandolin picking right. okay or it could be roll rolling you know like surf guitar picking or mandolin picking right or they could use an ebo or they could they could use a big reverb and if and and just like a brass player or a vocalist if you're holding this pitch and you run out of air then you reinstate the pitch but but you do it without a big attack right so you so you try to make it as continuous as possible within the parameters of your instrument and then they got quite good at it after that where whereas another one that was a a piece of cake for the guitars and we could do a whole piece with like one sign was this one called pedal okay and it's basically the analogy is when you put the sustain pedal down on a piano and then play one uh, sforzando chord and you got this and then it dies out a natural reverberation so if I was doing pedals, they'd play these chords, you know, and then the chord would die out. But you start going like this around the room, and you get these chords piling on top of each other. It was incredible, you know. So that was a sign that worked really well. The other one that was amazing with the guitar is the har was the harmonics then opening into feedback. I mean, you could do 20 minutes with just those two signs. I mean, and just and then it's just about dynamics, you know, and 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 shaping. Right. Well, and what made you uh, choose these particular, ultimately six guitarists out of however many you had to choose from? It was it was more about what I heard in their playing, in the different situations that they played in. So it was since since it wasn't a workshop, since it was something that I really wanted to move forward, and it had a goal of recording. And I didn't know at the time that I was going to be moving in a year, you know. So basically, this ensemble had the lifespan of one year, and it really, since we only got together once a month to play, and then we played a concert, and then we played. We did a lecture demonstration, and then we did the recording. We really only got together and played like maybe 15 times. But it was over the fact that it was once a month, what you learned from this first session, would you had some time for it to filter in, you know. But it really was knowing these musicians, actually having played with them, and just what I heard in their playing, you know, I mean, there's a zillion guitar players out there and they all come from different, either they're playing a very specific style on their guitar. All of these players were playing different styles of music, but what I appreciated about their playing as individuals was their kind of what they individually brought to that instrument. They weren't what I would consider generic guitar you know, players. The, we just finished you know. the book, and the book is now at the designers. Because okay. Butch passed before he finished his book. And uh, he, he assigned, it was like a group of five people that have been working on this. And we just finished it, and, and hopefully it's going to be out um, this summer. And hopefully, and it looks like it's going to be out both in English and Italian. Because uh, uh, it's interesting, Butch did this for 30 years, but the, the, the place where they really embraced it the most was in Italy. 